All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Wendell. Uh, I'm with MVP Healthcare. Uh, today, we're going to uh, do a talk on a day in the life of a security analyst. So I have some members of my team here today that are going to go over um, some of their day-to-day -day life, what they've done um, at MVP, and sort of what you can expect if you go into the security analyst profession um, for your day-to-day -day life to be. So first off, yeah, <laughs> it is. So first off, a little bit about MVP Healthcare. So how many people have heard of MVP Healthcare? We're a healthcare um, insurance payer and based out of Schenectady, New York. Uh, we were founded in 1983. We're a non-for-profit organization. Uh, we have about 1,500 employees, um, 8,000 employer groups that we work with, and more than 600,000 um, members. From a membership perspective, that's actually active members. The actual data that we're um, responsible for securing is in the millions based on how long we've been around. Uh, we probably have close to about 5 million uh, records um, that were responsible for individual personally identifiable information and protected health information. We're based out, of base, out of New York. We do have some presence in Vermont, but we pretty much cover the Rochester um, area to um, upstate New York and then down to Terrytown. Our membership profile um, is important only because of the regulations that we're subject to based on our uh, membership profile. So from a Medicaid and um, Medicare perspective, that's all of our government programs business. So that's where our CMS requirements come in. So they push um, security requirements to us because of that. We also have a big ASO footprint. So ASO is the large companies like an IBM, a GE, a Golub that pay MVP administrative services to provide healthcare, basically the healthcare network and process their claims. With that come contractual requirements that those groups um, push security requirements onto us for protection of their data. And they do regular audits um, on that. And then our commercial side of the house is basically all of your traditional healthcare products that you would get through a PPO. Um, but what comes with that is all the regulations from Department of Financial Services. So that's our regulator here in New York State. Um, so DFS recently published new cybersecurity regulations, if you are aware. So we're subject, um, being an insurance um, payer, we are actually subject to those regulations and are working to meet those um, new cybersecurity regulations. Our first attestation is next year um, as it relates to that, but there are many things that went into place uh, March of this year. So some things of a, a security analyst. Uh, so skills and prior experience. Some of the things that I look for um, when hiring and recruiting in, information security analysts are hard to come by. The market is uh, very demanding to try and find um, talent and retain it. Um, as many of you probably know. Um, so skills and prior experience, most of the things I look for is obviously technical capabilities, uh, but the most, most importantly is probably interpersonal communication skills. So interpersonal communication, we work across a lot of our business areas um, and also across all of our IT folks. Um, so it's important to have the technical skills, both application, OS, database, you name it, to know how the systems at MVP, and we have a fairly complex infrastructure, how all of those fit together. But then we have to be able to communicate well with both legal, so we're working with our attorneys, internal audit, and then also all of our business partners. Um, so we have to be able to sort of break down that technical speak um, and be able to put it in layman's terms as it re relates to that. Um, some of the education and training, obviously we, I've hired actually two of the folks that will speak today are new recent grads out of the um, SUNY Albany program for informatics with a um, concentration in cybersecurity. So that's um, where we've been actually finding a lot of new talent. Um, and training is also important. We send all of our folks to conferences. Um, we have CISSPs on, on staff. Um, and it's an important thing to, to kind of continually be out and educating yourself because cybersecurity landscape is changing on a daily basis. Um, some of the things that some of my team members will talk about is security governance. So a lot of what we do is governance within our uh, company. So a lot of our focus is on identity and access management governance around who has access to what, recertifying those systems. Some of the security controls, so we work on implementing security controls within our environment. Some things we can control directly, others we have to work across our infrastructure, networking, desktop teams to put security controls into place. Security monitoring, that goes into basically monitoring our entire uh, infrastructure environment. Um, so we have you know, a security event and information management systems that's processing millions of events every day. The team's responsible for responding to those alerts, and they'll get into some of the things that they've seen on a day-to-day -day basis as it relates to that. And then the security investigation. That's obviously once we get an alert, trying to be able to find out, be analytical about 
what what really what's this alert telling me? Go find other go you know tap into other systems that we have to do some forensics um, capability. And in some cases, we work with our third party security partners um, to help us in in investigations that we're leading up. We also get involved in all of our uh, any kind of corporate compliance investigations. So if we have either internal or external sources that file corporate compliance complaints that involve security. Uh, my team would get involved in doing those investigations and working with uh, our corporate compliance team to, to you know, follow up on those um, investigations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ken Oliver. He's going to give you insight into what we do on education and training um, at MVP. How's everyone doing? Good, good to hear. So the security awareness program, I got started by saying that, you know, if you do not like dealing with people heads on, if you're not a people person, um, getting into security awareness program is probably not for you. You're gonna be at time be frustrated. You're gonna have people emailing you saying, hey, look, I saw this email, it looks suspicious, but I clicked on it anyway. So there's gonna be times where you wanna like reach through your machine and choke people but you gotta remember that your job here to train people and get them to understand that, hey, sometimes, you know, when something doesn't look odd, ask someone, you know, hey, this looks suspicious, should I actually open this up? And oftentimes, it's probably not. I also wanna talk about the three C's of security awareness program. I'm gonna to touch on communication, collaboration, and culture. And also inside that, when I do a security awareness program, I touch on social engineering, educating user about malware, and also creating chain information like newsletters and emails for the company but also want to touch about the curse of knowledge. It's the cognitive bias that occurs when an individual communicates with another individual, unknowingly assumes the other person has the same background or understanding. So basically, I speak IT, people in the other room speak IT, but if I talk to somebody who's a nurse, I say, hey, ADP this, blinders. I have no idea what you're talking about. So it's very important when you do scale wins program, you talk to them in ways they can understand. So first, the foundation, communication. It simply is talking to them in a way they understand. Too often we have these programs, you know, we put out these new letters saying, you know, don't do this, don't open up this, or no, you can't access the social media. But we gotta turn that around and say, you know what, you gotta explain to them exactly why you can't do certain things. Instead of saying no, saying things like, you know, try, you know, <clears throat> go into the actual site directly. Instead of saying, don't click on a link, First, does the link look suspicious versus don't do this? Those are very important. You also gotta make it understand that how do these topics relate to them? So when I do like a, a campaign or I do like a newsletter, instead of saying, you know, don't do this for the organization, I try to make it relate to them. Basically saying, you know, instead of like clicking on a social um, a, um, phishing campaign at, at the office, think about your work computer. A lot of times people put up emails in their um, personal email account. You gotta make sure that when you communicate with them, and also in language they can understand too and take it back home and take it to their friends. I think we're all familiar with the, um, what is it, the Nigerian, you know, prince. Hey, you know what, send me your banking information. You know, I'll forward you half of my son money. It's pretty well known, but surprisingly, it still works because people don't fully understand and people are not communicating and saying, hey, look, if you see this, I, I was taught back in my company. If it looks suspicious, just go ahead and delete it. Next thing I want to talk about is engagement. Um, back in May of 2011, the CDC published a blog uh, preparing people how to prepare for the apocalypse. And of course, about three hours later, the website went down. But if you actually went at the blog post, I mean, all they did was change the actual topic to from preparing for a hurricane to preparing for a zombie, and that got regional attention. So, and also in a computer program, you gotta make it interesting, you gotta make it fun, you gotta make it engaging. You gotta make it to where, you know, people will take time in their busy day and give you about five minutes out of their busy schedule and say, hey, look, this looks important, let me open it up and take a chance to look and read it. So I'm also wanna reflect back on last year. Um, my teammates and I, we had this meeting about this word about ad hoc file transfer. If you, can you raise your hand if you know what that means? Like ad hoc file transfer? Yeah, of course you know what it means. So, you know, ad hoc is Latin for, for this. But a lot of times, like you don't speak Latin, if you're not sure what IT is, you know, they try to understand, like, how do you transfer a file from my company to another company? And you sit there and try to figure out, you know, what is this language that, you know, the IT team is trying to communicate to me? And we had a nice long debate for weeks on end 
of trying to come up with a term that everyone can relate to. And so me being the new guy and some of the older people on my team who are kind of stuck with the curse of knowledge, you know, they've been doing this for a while and they're using the correct term, but they're not using a term that everyone can understand. And so my job, one of my roles is to pretty much bring in a fresh set of eyes and new ideas and say, hey, look, I know this is maybe the correct way to pronounce something, but let's take this actual term and transfer it to something that everyone can understand. The next thing I'll talk about is collaboration. I have some amazing people at MVP that helps me with my security awareness program. Um, case in point, there's a woman that I work with, um, Jen, who works over in Terrytown um, and over in Hudson Health, uh, New York. And she has pretty much taken my ideas, transferred it, and put it in ways that I would never actually think of doing. I'm an IT guy, I'm an introvert by nature. And so by having her come in here and say, hey, you thought about adding this or adding this image, she'll take an idea that I have and just takes it and make it 10 times better. So it's very important that they collaborate. We also people in urban HR who did the training for the company. Um, our last training, training video we had, the person was kind of bland, but same way as I'm, I'm talking, I'm more of a, hey, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. After a while, people tune out. But you have people in HR who is like very enthusiastic and going, hey, you know, have your mother told you, you know, think before you click and make it sound fun, interesting. These are ideas that have never come out of my own. So therefore, it's very important that we collaborate with other people in our team and other departments because they can give you a fresh set of ideas that you probably would never even recognize. And the last thing I want to do is touch on culture. Culture is one of those things that you can't do overnight. It's going to take time to get people to understand, you know, you got to think before you click. You know, if it looks suspicious, out of place, don't click on it. When you see an email, look at the actual from line. There's some place you know is it spelled correctly. You know, having people take the time and slow down and you actually read the content of the email and say, does this even make sense? A lot of times it doesn't. Like for instance, you know, we have that, was it the W2 email that goes around saying, hey, I'm your CEO, can you please submit me W2? That's been going around for the last three or four years, but it's still successful. I'm constantly reading on blogs about companies losing out millions, hundreds of thousand dollars because, you know, people are not taking the time to say, hey, look, this stuff looks important. Let me take a second on my business schedule and say, hey, look, what can I do to actually secure my network? And I'll take the skills that I learned and transfer it to my home environment as well. So when I do a security awareness program, I touch on three topics. I talk about social engineering, malware, and training. Now, social engineering should be like something we all should be familiar with if, you know, we all get that email saying, hey, look, uh, can you please click this and, you know, enable a macro, uh, that kind of thing. A lot of times, you know, there's some malware social engineering sites that say, hey, look, can you supply us with your credit card number, date of birth, to a fake site like upsondelivery.com. And people think like, oh, it looks real. It's got the same, you know, colors. But people don't sit there and go, wait a minute. I've never logged this site before, but I'll still put my information in there anyway. It's like, people, take the time, look at what you're doing. There's no rush. A lot of times these emails come in with these call to action, you know, like, hey, if you don't do this by, you know, tomorrow, your account will be closed. They get people to think like, this is really important. So they pretty much, you know, lower your defenses. Instead of taking your time reading it, they say like, hey, if I don't get this done, the repercussion. And there's also malware. Getting people to understand that malware is basically malicious software. And that includes viruses, Trojans, you know, anything that does from keylogger strokes, a lot of people who are nurses, you know, people who do work customer care. I mean, I have a computer, I can do Outlook, I can do Word, I got a job. But a lot of times people don't understand the stuff behind it. You know, the internet is a fun place to explore certain things, but there's a dark side too. And getting people to understand that, you know, you just don't click on anything you get or open up emails is key to a successful security awareness program because our biggest surface is our email. And the next thing I want to touch on is training. So this is something new that, you know, I'm getting an opportunity to take on. Um, I started working on the new hire program. Basically, anybody coming to our program, I teach them basically about email security awareness um, and also about phishing campaigns because as an organization, once a month or more than that, we actually want a phishing campaign so people are aware that, hey, these are the tactics that we're running or these are some of the things you should look out for. And for the most part, people are taking this stuff and actually applying it because, you know, I look at the reports and I see people who fail the phishing campaign month after month, but then that one moment, they actually say, you know what, this looks out of place. Let me go and actually notify someone and say, hey, look, is this a legit email or should I respond to it? And within less than about 15 minutes, I either myself or a member of my team will open it up and say, hey, look, this is good. But the also thing we do is work on our training and policy. Basically, everything we do, we have a formalized process saying, hey, look, this is how we do certain things in our organization. This is how we meet compliance. 
And so I'm going to turn this over to my colleague who's going to talk more about training. I'm sorry, more about policy and procedures. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Anissa and I'm also on the security team here at MVP Healthcare. Um, so, as Ken said, I will be talking about security governance today, um, and I'll be touching on these four main points, I suppose. So, I guess I'll be talking about policies and procedures, um, compliance, and how the security team works with our compliance team to make sure that we're up to date with our regulations. Identity management, as Matt said, we need to make sure we're we know who is in our company, who has access to what. Um, and we need to recertify that on a yearly, if not more often, basis. Um, as well as data access governance. Um, this is more about, you know, what or where is our data? Where is our data? What are we doing with it? Um, where is it being stored? You know, all these things are super important that we as a company need to make sure that we're aware of. So policies and procedures. Um, IT security policies are important for multiple reasons. The first reason is it's important for us as a team to know exactly how things are done, how they should be done to our team standard and a company standard. Um, there's a lot of us on our team who lead certain projects, who do certain things. It doesn't mean that everyone on the team does everything. We have things in our mind that we know how to do, but it doesn't mean that my coworker Ken would know exactly how to do what I'm doing because it's not possible. So um, these things need to be documented in a process, in a procedure, um, screenshots, post things in there so we as a team can reference these documents and make sure that we all know, um, you know how to do whatever it is that we need to do. Um, secondly, these policies and procedures are important for us as a company as a whole. So if you know, I have someone in the business department or the, let's say the internal audit department who needs to know, okay, how are we as a security team locking down access to something? Can I, I can give them an answer verbally or I can be like, point them to this document. It's all written here. Please read it. You know, this maximizes efficiency. We don't have to waste time having a meeting with two hours explaining how this process is done. Um, we, my coworker and I worked on this project recently and I, I have things in my head that I haven't been documenting because I just haven't gotten around to it. So he always asks me, you know, where's the document for it? And I'm like, you know, I'm working on it eventually. I'll get to it. But that's just a prime example. There are two of us on the team who are, you know, subject matter experts at it. But if someone else wants to know it, they have to talk to me or Mark about it instead of referencing the document. So that's just a prime example of that. Um, in other topics I'll be talking about with compliance regulations, so when we have auditors that come in and, you know, test our environment, whatever, we need to point them to certain documents. They're not going to come talk to me at my cube and be like, hey, how do you do this? You know, I need to have that in document sent over to the compliance team, then sent over to the auditing team to kind of have all that, um, you know, there readily available. Um, okay, next I'll be talking about compliance. So as I referenced earlier, we are we are compliant with multiple regulations because we are a healthcare company. We are healthcare IT. We need to make sure that our um, information is always secure. So um, I think IT security and compliance are often synonymized and people think like, yeah, you know, they're the same thing, but they're really not. Like they're completely different, different things. And here at MVP, we have two separate teams. And one of my uh, primary job responsibilities to work heavily with the compliance team to make sure that, you know, the reference documents that I mentioned before, policies and procedures are all put into place, up to date, published, ready to go. Um, and then it's like kind of a, the compliance team for us is kind of a middle ground between the auditing team so we can make sure that um, we are compliant, but also the auditors are aware of that on their end. Um, so. There are many things that come with the compliance on our team. There are um, documents and databases and many tracking tools that we use that we need to make sure are up to date with our system applications. Um, as Matt mentioned, we have applications, databases, OSs, and we don't just know that off the top of our head. All of that is documented in a database um, and with con constantly needs to be updated. And that's what I do a lot with the compliance team. Um, so, 
with compliance comes with, you know, making sure that we are compliant and how you do that is um, what I'll be talking about more next, but that this kind of loops into identity management. And so to manage a company's um, identities and who has access to what, this is more of, this is, you need to recertify all of these things. So we as, we at MVP use a tool that imports all of our, um, our identities from all of our systems, all of our wherever, we have it in one place where we can see them all. So if you want to search me, you can see me, what I have access to, and this is a really great tool to see that. Um, so yearly, we need to make sure that we recertify these uh, accounts, and this is what's checked by auditors, so it all, it all really loops in together. Um, so we process files from all systems applications monthly and that's what many primary people on our team do you know every first week of the month when we get these files you need to process them correlate items you need to make sure that um if someone stopped working here their account is not active um and this happens quite a lot across the board everywhere like we all know minimum uh required access like not all of us have that i find that sometimes you know things are just should not have access to things and that's what recertification does every year um and moreover we need to process these monthly to make sure that we're up to date when that year time comes that we're we're all re ready to go um so we have multiple you know identities come at many different levels there's the user level there's the service account level there's the administrative level and these all are separate processes that we need to recertify so if a generic account has a certain um, you know, has certain access rights, we need to confirm with the subject matter expert of that account, hey, what is this account used for? Where does it have access to? Um, who has access to the password? You know, all these things need to be checked all the time to make sure that some admin isn't going to run server privileges somewhere, you know, just because they have the rights to do so. Um, and so lastly, I'll be talking about data access governance. Um, so I guess moreover, identity management, it's really important to know not who has access to the data, but where this data is located. So um, we, you know, there are, there's data, we, so we have PHI. As a company, we, we, there's a lot of HIPAA regulations on us because there's PHI. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows what that is, but it's personal health information. Um, and, you know, we just have, we, we at MVP have many drives for these things. So there's secure drives, there's public drives, there's shared drives, and we need to make sure that there are constantly um, secured locations where PHI is located. Um, so, yeah, so we, so we have tools implemented in our environment where we can see, hey, someone reaches out to me about this folder, I can be like, I can tell you exactly which group has access to it, what they are able to do, what level of access they have, and that's really important for us as a team to work among ourselves as well as across the board with other teams to make sure, okay, why does this person have access to this when they don't even need it? You know, maybe this person needed access a year ago, but they don't anymore. And this is all important to constantly lock down all of this access. Um, there, there's also certain situations I'm sure all of you have come through where, hey, this folder's deleted off this drive. Who did it? Why, you know, why is it gone? Who moved it? You know, there are tools out there that um, MVP has to kind of let us know who did what and when it was done, what the action was taken. And this is all important to maintain compliance, maintain that management of all of our data, all of our groups. It's all super important for us to know who did what, where is the file located, who has access, all of these things are super important. Um, and so in, in regulation with um, compliance and just to kind of touch on what Matt and Ken were saying about how we need to collaborate with all these other departments it's super important because we there there are many departments within the company that Matt was saying we have to work with legal finance um, credentialing many different places and a lot of them um, are not technical you know verse like people I can say oh well who has access to this you know drive they're gonna be like you know I don't know how to look at that and so it's more like a lot of people just access certain things in their own department and they're not really sure how they have access to it. Um, they're like, okay, you know, I just get to it because I, I kind of just get to it, you know, and that's what we as a security team need to do to make sure we're aware of 
um, you know, how, how are they getting access to this certain location? Should they be accessing this? Does the group that they're a part of allow them to access other things that they should not have access to? Um, and that's what another role that I'm doing on my team right now is I'm working with various departments, um, legal, finance, you know, what I mentioned before, to kind of sit with them and see, okay, how are your team members granted access to these very secure folders? Is there anyone in this group who shouldn't have access to that? And then it's, it's also raising very technical, you know, very high technical awareness to non-technical parties because now they're like, oh, I know what a drive is now, or I know what secure is supposed to be on you know and it's um it's really important to kind of collaborate as you know it's it's really important as to what we do as a team to ensure that we're not over speaking someone because we have technical knowledge and someone else doesn't so we need to make sure that we share that in very layman terms but not belittling anyone and you're making sure like hey this is what this means so implement it you know like work on you now you know what it is and move forward um yeah, and I guess with that, I'll be passing it over to my colleague, Mark. Hey, everybody. Um, so obviously, I'm the old guy in the group. Um, and I'm the guy that nags him to write documentation. Um, so today, that's right. So today, I'm going to talk about um, uh, not just a day in the life, but more about implementing controls, and I'll read you directly what from SANS is. Controls are technical administrative safeguards or countermeasures to avoid, counteract, and minimize loss of unavailability due to threat acting on machines, uh, matching vulnerability, i.e. security risk. All right, so what does that mean, right? That means we've got to protect our stuff. And how do we do it? All right, so that's what we're going to talk about today. And So um, over the last uh, several years, we've been... Um, 15 months, I think, is what I went back about some of the changes that we've been making and the things that have been keeping my life busy, their life busy, and all of the other members of the uh, security team busy, implementing those controls to make MVPs data safe. It's very important uh, that we do that. You guys obviously know that. You're here from, uh, you're here for to find out what we do every day and. Uh, so we're going to go into there and, and, and the collaboration. We have a, we did we've done a lot in 15 months. So in collaboration with the team, we've kind of narrowed it down to these three buckets uh, and we'll put these up here, and I'll talk about these uh, as I go through it. So the first one we're going to talk about is content filtering. So I came up with some subcategories here about web, email, spam, and encryption. So for our content filtering. Um, what we do is, is like most organizations, uh, we have a proxy server. So if you get, if you're going to surf out or surf in the net, you're you're going to go through a proxy server. Uh, so we we have replaced our proxy server uh, last year, uh, upgraded it actually, uh, along with uh, how we were reading files coming in. A lot of time went into uh, the replacement of those and 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 the analysis behind what we do. We worked closely with our Intel services team, which are the Windows administrators, to, uh, to uh, help them, assist them. A lot of settings need to be set. You guys understand all that. And I'm just going to keep it real high, just so you guys know that. So when I say setting set and buttons pushed, you understand what I mean. All right, so radio buttons checked and so forth. So um, a lot of hours go into that. It is, um, you guys, I, I thought we were going to have a younger crowd, no offense. Uh, but you guys seem like you've been in the business for a while, so you understand that it's not simple as putting something in and turning a switch on, right? So that's, that's what we go through, and that is the, the, the analysis uh, that we do. Um, so for our email, we've enhanced our spam cap capabilities. We've turned a lot of really cool things on. Uh, mostly one of the biggest things we've done is, uh, is our anti-spam, um, and we've, it's not our anti-spam, it's our spam and our anti-spoofing. So um, that was a big win here at, at MVP. Anissa, I think, talked, or I'm sorry, Ken talked on the W-2 emails. I need this email coming from the president of the company, CEO, and so forth. So we, um, so we no longer accept uh, outside entities unless you're whitelisted. That was a huge project that we worked with our exchange administrators to go through. There's a lot of companies that we do business with. We had to whitelist. We're talking thousands of rows of data a day that we have to go through and analyze to
Make sure that we're not blocking good emails that come from companies that we do business with. Again, it's just a day in the life of going through that. Um, so the next one is encryption. So it's not the encryption that you're thinking of sort of as a laptop or putting on a thumb drive, but uh, HTTPS. 60% um, of the data that comes into MVP was encrypted. And we were unable to scan that. And that was a scary promise given where everyone's going. I mean, you go to Google and it's HTTPS now. So last year, um, we did a couple of things as we implemented our own internal CA server so that we could start SSL decrypt. And it was a long process. You're know, talking legal has to get involved to understand what we're reading. You know, we have to open the data, read it, scan it, re-encrypt it, and send it back on. That's very, very touchy stuff that we have to do. So it talks, you know, so again, the organization's understanding who you're dealing with. Uh, and so that was, that was a big win now. So if it comes in, the MVP, we now decrypt it, we read it, we scan it. Is it malicious? Uh, does our content server like it or not like it? Uh, and then it sends it back on. So that took a, a lot of time. Lot, the whole group was involved with that, with the implementation of the, of the CA server and with, um, with the SSL portion of that. Yeah. Of Office? Yeah. Yeah, 2000, yeah, we're still on 2010. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the next one is endpoint protection. This is my monochrome slide. Thank you very much. Um, I couldn't find any nice colorful ones to do this. So endpoint. So endpoint protection. Uh, Ken's talked about training, uh, training the users on not clicking things and, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's tough, it really is. So what do we do? What do we do? We do our best to make sure that uh, we put protection in place to either it doesn't get to the user or if it does get to the user, that something on the workstation itself will help protect the user as well. So we've done, we've done some pretty good things. We've, um, we've done some changes in MVP's environment. We've gone to a very virtual environment in our data center. Uh, so that made our Intel services guys uh, look at a uh, different antivirus product. So that in turn made us look on our desktops. What are we going to do? So um, that was a very, so, so we looked at the focus of changing out our endpoint uh, protection. That was a, a, a nice, that, that was, we kicked off a good POC. MVP doesn't do a lot of POCing or hadn't in the past. And that was one of our first times that we gotten together as a IT community and ran a, a proof of concept, if you don't know what a POC is. Uh, a lot of, you know, I don't know if you guys go out there and do that, but a lot of people we brought in, we saw some demos, we talked to the vendors, we picked a product based on feature set based, based versus based on how it would react in our environment. So, um, so our endpoint protection for AV was, uh, was really good. So we, uh, we went through that and we made a change in that. We, and we chose a vendor that offered a lot of additional features. It doesn't just do endpoint or AV uh, protection. It also, one thing we, we uh, Im implemented is uh, removable storage lockdown. So you can no longer come into MVP and plug in a thumb drive. Anything that's a removable storage, you will not be able to plug it in. Big win. Um, you know, I, that was, Ken and I worked on that project and I probably looked at maybe four million rows of data uh, because people were plugging in more stuff than we really had an idea. It was, pr it was pretty eye-opening about who was plugging in what. Uh, we just recently implemented that and um, we did it um, without notification. We just... <laughs> Yep, we just turned it on, and uh, we knew we were going to do it, but we didn't let our end users know, and it was uh, it was a culture shock. Uh, we, it, we we did that because you know we weren't quite sure about if, you know um, what was going on. So basically, we just wanted to turn it on. It was a culture shock for our end users. Uh, I think one of the biggest questions is, is, oh my God, can I still charge my iPhone on my desktop? Um, so and the answer is yes. We let them do that. Um, Yeah, we, so we, uh, I would say, 
our, mo our mobile users, we probably have 600 laptops now. Yeah, so we're probably at 600 laptops. Everyone else is running a, a desktop. We have about 12 for, uh, uh, Macs in various flavors um, throughout the organization, mostly in our marketing folks. And I think uh, one of our one of our IT guys has a Mac because he does web support. Uh, and if there's a problem, somebody call him with a Mac. He, he handles that as well. Do providers are not carrying around tablets to carry on laptops? We don't, we don't do providers. Oh. All right, so we're a health insurance organization. Yeah. yeah so we, we, we dabbled in tablets, iPads, a couple years ago. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, and I don't even think we have any more iPads on the network anymore. We got rid of them. I think we're getting into some Surface Pros now, but that's about as close as about as close as we're getting. So, uh, and uh, MVP does not allow uh, personal devices on our network. We are uh, you cannot bring your laptop in, plug in, and do work. It just we don't we don't allow that. So, um, in both process and policy, that's a good question. Though, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we went with we went with Sophos, yeah. So uh, we did. We're trying to keep this meeting not vendor agnostic, but uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, some oh, some of the other things we've done is uh, locked down local administrators. Um, most of you have read that a lot of things is privileged access leads to a lot of the breaches, right? You understand that, so. We went through and we went cleaned up. Ken ran with this for the most part. Uh, did a lot of work on cleaning up, getting rid of people out of their uh, local admins on the on the desktops and laptops. And uh, there's now a process that the users have to go through to get local admin access. We get reports every month. We go through the reports, and if it doesn't line up, you get a phone call. Why well, you did that, but we, we log, so we get to see a log. We pull the logs, find out who gave that person access and why. Okay, does it match a ticket? Is there a ticket? So, so we have a very good process in place for that as well. Now, the other thing we've done is uh, elevated, uh, if you have an, a need for an elevated function, a privileged function, you now get a separate account. Um, our desktop team was a local admin on all the desktops, like they should be because they need access, but they're doing everything with their regular account. So we got rid of that. Now they have a separate account to do just that work with their, uh, with their elevated account. And we're working on that across the environment as well. That's a very long cultural change process that we have in place. Um, so the third thing that I'm gonna talk about today is our advanced threat protection. So this is a buzzword that came around, I would say, two, three years ago. Um, so I figured I'd throw it up there and I think I have the absolute coolest, uh, whatever that is there ever. So the lifeguard, I mean, I don't know what it's called, the lifeguard. So I, we voted and I won. Um, so, uh, so advanced threat protection, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. So I'm gonna go briefly on some of the things that we've done. Uh, so back 15 months ago, as I was talking about, one of the things we kicked off was a compromise assessment, right? Compromise assessment is a really in-depth pen test. Uh, it talked about internal and external so that we could get an understanding of where we were in our protection. That kicked off a lot of projects, a lot of things that I'm talking about, a lot of things that have been keeping me busy and sometimes awake at night uh, came out of this from 15 months. So we're still, we're still going 15 months later out of that compromise assessment of things that we need to implement because as you know, you can't implement everything at once, you don't have the time, and then once you get it implemented, you don't have the support for that, right? We all know that. Um, uh, our security feeds to, to our SIM, right? Our SIM is our log collection um, aggregator that we have. So we have, we have been uh, growing more and more and more, sending more and more logs and really working our log aggregator a lot. We have a gentleman in Rochester, uh, Justin, who has, and that's what he does, I would say that 70% of his day, maybe 60% of his day is just to babysit this, looking at alerts, alarms, making sure that he's getting his feeds on a regular basis, um, and if anything's wrong, he investigates that. He works really heavily with all of the departments 
uh, within the infrastructure and op or the groups within the infrastructure and operations team to making sure we're getting all those feeds. If it doesn't happen, he's on it uh, and he's working to making sure we're getting those. Um, and later when I talk about incident response, you'll understand why. Uh, as part of that, we just, uh, we just turned on user behavior analytics. Uh, so that is new. It's a new, uh, kind of a new buzz thing as well, right? Who knows what, who's been hearing about user behavior analytics, right? It's not just about logs, but then it's the logs and understanding and learning what the user is doing and risk scoring that user. So that's something we were really getting into uh, about there. And, and again, Justin is really wanting, running with that as well. So that's a, that's, that's a very promising. We just, got our, we just got our first two alerts from our UBA the other day, and it was really exciting. All right, really was. Yes, sir. There's no machine that's user right now. It, there's no machine that's user, right? If, if, Bob, if Bob logs into this machine every day, uh, n I don't know if they qualify it as AI. All right, the, I don't. I don't think I've read in the literature where it's really like an AI. We were look. We've been looking at an AI platform as well. As a matter of fact, I've been meeting with them on Friday next Friday about that. So we've we've looked into that, and I don't. And um, so it's. Uh, I don't. I don't think they they classify that as AI. So they have capabilities that they're looking at. Okay. <clears throat> Um, enhancing our vulnerability management program, um, you know, we've been we've been growing our, our you know um, our, our vulnerability management program has been was very just a cyclical program where we do this, we do that, we do this, they do that, and and we've really taken it to the next level where we're getting into um, feeds uh, from very threat feeds to put those into our vulnerability management program. And that's probably the other another twenty percent of what Justin does as well. He should be here, but uh, you know he he handles that as well. Uh, vulnerability management is making sure that you know post scans of our servers after patches are done to make sure that we patch what we were supposed to do, uh, and then it falls in. It's a very cyclical thing, a very important process that we're here. We've been growing that as well. Um, and so the last thing that I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ken, is. Uh, is our is is our highest threat protection implementation that we did um, last year? Uh, we were very, I want to say, privileged, blessed, thankful that we were. Uh, we, we got a project that gave us some money to go out and buy some uh, very uh, defense in-depth programs that we put in to help us protect our email, our endpoint, and uh, replace our aging firewalls. Uh, as well as doing some analytics behind all of that based on all of the data that it, that it gets as well. Uh, this, uh, this was a very long uh, project that took many, many hours uh, to implement, working across many uh, of the or people in the IT organization. Um, hundreds of meetings, lots of coordination, uh, lots of uh, implementation hours sitting with uh, with our vendor uh, but it was a, it was a really good um, it was a really a, a good win for MVP to to help us with what's going on um, and that was uh, so that was a, a big win that we have right now so so with that um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Ken who's going to talk about the security monitoring so we Talk about all of the things that we do. Now Ken's going to talk about what do we do with all that stuff. So earlier I talked about you know security awareness, people actually clicking on things. Well, occasionally people do click, and that gives me job security. So. <laughs> So, <laughs> yep. So I'm gonna talk about network, the reports, and also current events. So, mine is the cool outfit. I basically sit there and look coffee every day. I go through my logs. I go through, you know, our our physical security logs, and also I look at a lot of network tools to see exactly what happened the night before, just to make sure I don't miss anything. So, when it comes to network monitoring, you know, not to boast or brag, but like Mark said, we have some pretty cool stuff in our environment. I have sensors that monitor our network for any type of, you know, sites people visit. You know, people have those 
what's it called, drive-by clicks. People actually look and see what kind of uh, latest OS version you have in your uh, browser. And also we have email sensor that goes through and actually check every last piece of, sorry, every last email that comes through that's either laced with the URL or it's laced with type of, you know, missile attachment. Um, we also have a next gen antivirus that, you know, Mark touched earlier, we have the Sophos, that pretty much anything that's missed by our advanced security program that we have, our network sensors, they actually have another layer of security that goes through and pretty much check everything. And I have a nice cool dashboard where I can see exactly where this person might have had like a pub, which is like a potential unwanted program, or as somebody who downloaded a, a virus. But you know, lately the kind of alerts that I'm getting is, you know, we have this, um, we have the Meg, the uh, McAfee Exchange server, and occasionally we have a semantic that actually quarantines a lot of emails. And let's begin lately is saying that all these email quarantine are being picked up by SOFA. So that's one of the things we're double checking, triple checking to make sure that nothing comes to our network. And like Mark said before, we also have user behavior analysts. Um, next week we have people coming in to kind of, you know, give us a rundown as far as how we can actually, you know, elevate some of our capabilities and see exactly what's going on. And actually say, you know, for instance, we have an employee who's got to leave. All of a sudden I see him downloading a bunch of files on the share drive. I want to be notified on that. It also comes with reports. I get plenty of reports. I get reports as far as people plugging in devices and blowing them. I get reports of people who plug in their personal cell phone and they use the guest Wi-Fi. Um, we also have the SCCM, which stands for the System Center Configuration Matter Manager. I get reports, you know, on a weekly basis, saying like, you know, we get servers that get spun up, you know, either once a month or once a week, and sometimes they don't have the antivirus cables that we need on them. So I look at those reports and make sure that action is being taken by the Intel team. That way, that no layer of security is being missed. The same thing goes to our host that we put on our endpoints to make sure that we have that capabilities to go there and investigate. And just to go back on network security monitoring, when I say we have some pretty cool stuff, and when it comes to like, you know, threat hunting, if I was, you know, if I had an alert that I want to like sit there and search on, I can actually say, for instance, I want to know everybody who visited, you know, Twitter on yesterday between these time periods, I can send a request out through my network and I get these requests back saying this machine did this, this machine that, and I can just dig and dig further. The same thing with our proxy. I can go on our proxy, say who went on this website here. Um, occasionally we get requests from HR saying, hey, look, I have a manager saying, you know, I'm not sure what the person spent their time on. I come to save the day and I look and I look to see exactly, hey, this is what this person spent their time with and it's all there ready to sit there and analyze data. And that's what I do on a 50% of my day. It's not doing uh, secret awareness. I'm actually doing security monitoring. I'm looking at our networks. I'm looking at our logs from the night before and seeing what people were doing. But you also got to look at not just the tools you have, you got to look at current events. So back when I was in college, which I may look old, but I spent 12 years of my life in the Marine Corps, so college is not very a priority. So after I left the Marine Corps, um, to stay abreast as far as what's going on in current events, you know, you got to go to dark reading or info uh, cybersecurity where you look at, you know, uh, industry that covers your zone. But also got to look at, see what may potentially target your environment. So for instance, when I came to MVP back in 2015, I started as an intern. And the big thing, the big thing for the helping for uh, healthcare was the cryptoware. You know, that was a huge thing that was coming in. And I was kind of curious as far as, you know, what are the IOCs or the indicator compromise? I want to know exactly what steps are taken so I can put alerts in place. And that way I can get a heads up and actually cut it off before it spreads in my environment. So I look at network monitoring, reports, current events, minus the cold outfit. And I'm pretty much sitting there every day and I'm looking to see exactly what can I do to be proactive to make sure that nothing happens that put my job in jeopardy or my organization. And that covers pretty much security monitoring. And I'll turn it back over to Mark Paisant, who will go and actually explain to you what happens when we become compromised. Or, yes. Coffee. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Coffee helps. Um, I spent, you know, back when I was in the military, I did a lot of stuff when it comes to being, you know, controlling our burnouts, um, meeting deadlines, trying to manage two different tasks. Um, you know, occasionally, you know, I'm managing, you know, physical security, infrastructure security. And like Mark said earlier, we have another teammate who works over in Rochester, Justin, who does a lot of the help for me and him. So therefore, it's a team effort. You know, I may do this on a daily basis, but I need help with someone. I can reach out to Anissa, I can reach out to Matt Wendell, and those guys will come in and say, hey, what do you need help with? I have history, or I got something you can work with, or give me in contact with someone, and that helps out a lot. I mean, it really does, and it helps with the burnout. So.
Thank you. So, Friday night 12th, what happened? Anybody? Want to cry. cry. There you go. Want to cry. Wow, want to cry. That really sucked, didn't it? Largest. Yeah, not for us. Don't worry. Not for us. Uh, Tuck for a lot of European companies. But uh, so these were some stats I brought up. I think uh, this has uh, now changed. Uh, Matt sent me an email that they've updated this and it's over a million, potentially two million computers now. Uh, I, I couldn't verify the information so I didn't update it. So four billion in losses, not just what the company had for, because their data was um, unusable, but forensics and bringing in you know, outside legal, bringing in companies to help them. And as you saw, about 150 50 countries. So, I mean, uh, this and, and this is, you know, when you have something come in, this is how you feel. So I've had, I've been on the receiving end before, and that's like, holy crap, how the hell did this get in? What am I going to do? I need coffee. Um, and Ken has the coolest coffee cup at MVP. We call it the Rook, by the way. So he doesn't have the outfit, but he's got the coolest coffee cup. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I, I uh, uh, just got a, a short time because we want to leave some time for uh, for questions. But so what happens when something gets in? Okay. So um, and, and I'm going to keep this really brief. We have some we have some documents that we, we write, and I, I brought I brought a couple of them with me, not for share, just for my own per reference. But you know we have an uh, incident response plan, and it, we have a specific cybersecurity incident response plan that we go through, and it lines out what we're supposed to do during the process, who does what, who informs what, and, and, and so forth, and, that's, and I'll leave it at high level. But not only that, we also have uh, what we do is uh, we have a threat intelligence and incident response form. Now, this is our document where we do take all the notes, do timelines, who's doing what, Who's doing? Who did what? When did it stop? Do they need more resources? When do we call for outside and so forth? So this is, and this is what this is. So, um, so that's our preparation. So we do a lot of preparation. Uh, we recently tied in our uh, DR and business continuity uh, team uh, into the security team because of, of these documents and that. And so, uh, so I'm, I play secondary for uh, our DR team. Uh, we have a gentleman who's solely dedicated to that, and I'm his backup. Um, so the life cycle, preparations, detection and analysis, you know, that's what we do. Ken just spent a ton of time talking about looking at their uh, uh, look, all traffic, monitoring alerts, and so forth. So something gets in, all right? Containment, eradication, and recovery. This is... Um, to me where all bets are off. You have, if you don't like somebody, it doesn't matter. You have to work with them, okay? If you've got a bone to pick with somebody, it doesn't matter. You've got to work with them. If they don't shower regularly, it doesn't matter. You've got to work with them. Uh, and that, that's the truth. It, it, it talks about that. It's a, again, tons of forensic. Um, if you're looking into a career change, I would look at digital forensics. I think that is a crucial area that we're really lacking in the world right now. The actual diving in and peeling data back, bits and bytes of data to find out what went where. If I was younger, I would be doing that, but I'm not going to change. Um, so containment, eradication, and recovery. Uh, you know, it's, it's and, and, and that goes back to a cyclical uh, here, right? So it's not just one circle, but then you've got to go back. After you think you have it eradicated and you think you're recovered, you go back and you run your scans again, right? Did we really get rid of everything? Uh, if we closed something, if we closed the port and we want to open it back up now, open it back up and run detection again, did we really block that? Do we really have the right IOCs in place to do that? Is our AV up to date? All those things that happen right there. And then our post-incident activity, right? I got somebody celebrating because it is a good feeling, right? It's not a good feeling to get breached, but it is a good feeling to know that you went through and you collaborated with a lot of your peers and you got it taken care of, right? Because we're not going to, you guys know, you're not going to stop everything. Someday something's going to get in and you're going to have to deal with it. It's just the bottom line. Um, you got to work with those to do it. So when you finish, though, after you've, you know, had your 15th pizza, um, or your Chinese, which is right across the street. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so we're lucky on that. 
Uh, you go right back into preparation. All right, so this, again, is a, a cycle right here. Incident response, believe it or not, is really cool. It really is. It's not just cleanup. It's like, oh, my God, I don't want to do that. Incident response is pretty cool. Uh, we wrote this um, document a long time ago, and, you know, knock on plastic, we've never had to use it. So, um, so, so we've been lucky on that. So with that, uh, I think our time is up because we wanted to leave five minutes for questions. Uh, and I'll hit the questions button, right? So for all of us, I'll stand up here. Yes, sir. How are you dealing with the interstate mandate that all health care insurance companies have to store logs for six plus years, but that didn't provide guidance in the in the regulations for all of us? So I'll let Matt, why don't you take that one? So all of us, as Mark said, all of us are insurance companies. Yeah. Um, so we have to make sure that we don't have to store logs for six plus years. Yes, sir. So, so um, we are, we're going to say product, product agnostic, but we use Zix. And a lot of our, a lot, a good amount of our customers, it's a very healthcare-centric product. So we have a lot of customers who, who use Zix as well. So it works very well. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. We've had Zix for... So Zix reads every email no matter what. So if you click the Zix button, it's automatic or it will. It knows based on content. So you had a question here? What do you see as the, the biggest challenges in retention, especially at like analyst positions? And what do you find are like the most effective ways to, to combat that? So that's a good question. I, 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 used, to be, I used to be a manager, got out of that, that business. Um, it is, I think, Burnout. I mean, somebody asked Ken about being burned out. About um, you know, the, it's a it's about you know. I've, I've been working with Matt for ever, you know, honestly, and I think it has to do a lot with the the gel that you have and how you meld together, right? I I think Matt is a great manager. I'm not just saying that. It's the, it's the honest truth. Um, so how do you combat that? You you have to you have to understand the person's needs. You can't be that strong. Um, I don't care what your personal life is about. Uh, you have to listen to your employee. If, and your employee has to tell you also what's wrong, right? Um, if, if there's a need for them and they want to go somewhere else, you've got to, got to ask them why. Why are you leaving, right? Is there, is there, is there a reason you're leaving? Uh, at MVP, we have, as you can see, all the projects. I mean, I, my, my first slide had all of our projects listed. And we get a lot done. We, we have... I, I am. I come to work every day enthused. I get up. I don't work from home very often because I love coming in the office. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but from M, from MVP, uh, you know, we have. It's about it's about the culture, right? Making sure the person uh, identifies with our culture. We have we try to have fun every day, and we really do. I think that I think that we have. A, I mean, honestly, we really have a great team. Yes. I really do. This is probably I've, I've been there for nine years. 
uh, total, seven as a full-time and two as a consultant. And this is probably one of, one of not the best team that I've, I've had the opportunity to work with. We come in, we, do, we, do we ever? <laughs> We just have fun. It really yes. is. So yeah, honestly, true. We work hard, but we have fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think the biggest thing is prioritization. I mean, I work mainly with them to prioritize. There's more work that we have, um, but we're always we've got the laundry list of things we want to get after. Um, usually, it's just what's the biggest risk. Let's go after that. As soon as we tackle that one off, we'll go off to the next one on the list. Um, rather than working on all of it at one time, because otherwise you make little progress. Uh, we try and chip them off, get them off.